If you'd like to attend the next Mad Thing in a Masjid event, inshallah ta'ala, live in a the masjid, then click on the link below. It will take you to a Telegram group that has the details for all the events that we do, inshallah. And you can then find the details for the next Mad Thing in a Masjid, which will be on a Saturday, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ان شاء الله brothers if you're participating can you guys all come in ان شاء الله تعالى you can bring your chairs i don't mind you can be comfortable no problem but just come in come in close بارك الله فيكم ان شاء الله تعالى if you're participating come in come in close بارك الله فيكم ما شاء الله ياسين good to see you man السلام عليكم how's things الله very good to see you الله يبارك الله يبارك Okay, so the topic of discussion today is on the topic of not being a simp. Put your hand up if you're a simp. I'm joking, I'm joking. Well, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> so my brothers, wallahi, this concept of being a simp is actually a problem. In this day and age, men are obsessed with women. To the point where they will do anything to get a woman. A simp is a man who will do anything to get a woman. And his day and night just revolves around women. Women, women, women. He'll sell his boys to get a girl. He'll sell what his family to get a girl. He'll give his money, all of his money. He'll spend whatever he can to get that girl to the point where the worst thing he will do, he'll give up his religion to get that girl. And this is something that the scholars, they spoke about. In Arabic, it's called al-ishq. Ishq is when you love something or someone so much that you become obsessive over it. You become what? Obsessive. Your love is obsessive. And all day, all night, all you can do is you can think of this person. Or you can think of the concept of women. That's it. That's all he thinks about. Imam Ibn Aqil, rahimahullah ta'ala, he described the kind of men who become, who become simps. Shocking that the scholars talked about simping, huh? Who's shocked? Put your hand up. Scholars address simps. <laughs> Imam Ibn Aqil, he said, ما كان العشق إلا لي أرعنا بطال. He said, the ones who become these obsessive lovers of women are the guys who have, who have what? Too much free time. They have nothing good to do with their lives. You know why? Because they say, وقل أن يكون في مشغول ولو بصناعة أو تجارة فكيف بعلوم الشرعية he said, very rare do you find a guy who's actually got something that he's doing in life that's going to be concerned about women all the time. The only guys who are always talking about women, 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 women. They go to the gym for women. They buy clothes for women. They try to get cars for women. They're just thinking and looking out for women are the guys who don't have much to do in life. It's because a guy, even if he's got a sana, even if he's got what? A profession. That he's focused in and he's good at his profession. Maybe he's an engineer. Maybe he's a scientist. Maybe he's a doctor. He's not going to have time for this stuff because he's dedicated. He's got stuff he wants to do in his life. Oh, Tijar or a businessman. You're out here and you want to have money. You want to earn money. You want to become rich so you can have the good, better things in life. So you can take care of your family. You can use your money to get to Jannah. But you can't. You can't make that money if you're thinking about women all day, every day. Because it will distract you. Then imagine if you're a person who's seeking knowledge. If you're seeking knowledge, there's no way you're going to focus on women. If a businessman, if a businessman is too busy to think about women, if an engineer or a doctor is too busy to think about women, then a man who's on his dean, searching for his dean, is going to be too busy as well. Pay attention. They're not talking about being in love with a woman and marrying her. There's nothing wrong with that. They're talking about al-ishq, which is obsessive love. He's just obsessed with women. No, no problem. A man can be what? He can be married. He can love his wife. He can take care of her. That's not a problem. You know why? Because he places his wife... In his hand, not his heart. But these guys, some of us perhaps, we place the women in our hearts. And then what we get broken. There was a, a guy who was kind of like a simp back in the day. His name was Jameel. And he, there's a poetry that he mentions describing his, his simpness, if that's a word. Basically, there was a jihad. And they told him to go out and fight in the battle. They said to him, go on, go out, fight, man. For the sake of Allah, he will defend the Muslims. So he says, يَقُولُونَ جَاهِدْ يَا جَمِيلُ بِغَزْوَةٍ وَأَيُّ جِهَادٍ غَيْرَهُنَّ أُرِيدُ He says, they tell me, go out and fight jihad in the sake of Allah. But he said, what jihad do I need except for the jihad of women? 
Because jihad means struggle, isn't it, linguistically? So he's saying, instead of struggling in the path of Allah, I want to struggle in the path of women. He said, Every time I'm sitting there, I'm talking to a girl, it's a good time. I'm just chilling, I'm cracking joke with her, she makes me smile, I make her smile. وَكُلُّ قَتِيلٍ عِنْدَهُنَّ شَهِيدٌ And any time a guy, he dies in the path of women, he dies a martyr. So some brothers are out there doing jihad fi sabi He said to me, I want to do jihad fi sabi li nisa. He said, I want to fight in the path of women, that's me. He goes, me, if I'm out there trying to get a woman and I die on the path of simping, that's it, I'm a martyr. I died for a good cause, I died for women, brother. Does that make sense? So these people exist. These people, they exist. Imam Al-A'asha, rahimahullah ta'ala, he explained, he said, أَرَى سَفَهًا لِلْمَرْئِ تَعْلِيقَ قَلْبِهِ بِغَانِيَةٍ خُودٍ مَتَى تَجْنُ تَبْعُدِي He said, it's dim-wittedness, and it's stupid and foolish that a man connects his heart to a woman. So much so that every time she comes close, he's happy. And when she goes away, he's sad. I'll be honest with you, that, that honesty is stupid. Shall I tell you why? Because actually you've given your happiness, you've given what? Your joy in the hands of a human who's selfish. Pay attention, are human beings selfish? Are they concerned about their own happiness? Every human is concerned about their own happiness. Imagine you put your happiness in the hands of a person who only care about themselves. Are they going to keep you happy for very long? No. No. She comes close, you're happy. <gasps> She's here, look at that. She goes away. Oh, I'm sad. Heartbroken. She left me. This is something from dimwittedness. Abdullah ibn al muqaffa He said, I'lam anna min awqa al-umur fi al-deen wa anhakiha lil jasad. Pay attention, the statement is powerful. He said, no, that the things that harms a person's religious, religion the most and the thing that harms a person's even physical body the most وَأَتْلَفِهَا لِلْمَالِ And destroy his, destroys a man's wealth the most. وَأَقْتَلِهَا لِلْعَقْلِ And damages his mind the most. وَأَزْرَاهَا لِلْمُرُوءِ And destroys his honor the most. وَأَسْرَعِهَا فِي ذِهَابِ الْجَلَالِ وَالْبَقَارِ And makes what? His respect in front of the people go the most. Is what? الْغَرَامُ بِالنِّسَاءِ To be excessively in love with women. He says this is something that what? No one, people respect a guy like that. A guy, she, she, she doesn't respond to his call. Oh, oh my God, she doesn't like it. It's very sad. It's very sad. Even a girl, what? Look at how it is nowadays. A guy is so in love with a girl. She's his girlfriend. She talks to other men. And you can't even say goodbye to her. Even having a girlfriend is haram. But at least have the honor that your girl talks to other men. And you're okay with that. You're so in love that you what? You let even your own self-respect and your honor go. It destroys the wealth. She comes to you, can I get this? Can I get that? You're spending money on her. You're buying her stuff. You're spending money on yourself for her. Clothes for her, not even for yourself. It makes your wealth go and it makes all of the stuff that you have go. It makes all of your stuff, it makes it what? Go. Does that make sense? But then the Imam said, Bali nisa ubin nisa. Sometimes, Afwan is a point he mentioned, and a guy he might even have a girl. But what's he doing? He's not looking at the next one. Every time you have a girl, what do you do? You look at the one who's who you don't have. Hatta he's married, he's got a wife. He now looks at the woman that he doesn't have. And he's so in love with her. But pay attention, he may not even know he exists. And the grass not even always green on the other side. He sees a girl walk past and suddenly he's, he's what? Head over heels. Look at her. I want to marry her. She must be so great. Etc. Etc. So on and so forth. But she doesn't even know that you exist. And he says, why is it that you're just going crazy, a woman? He said, He said, one woman to another woman is like how food is to another food. What's the difference? I have two bananas. At the end of the day, what are they? They were bananas, right? I have two apples. Are they, is, there, is, there, is there much of a difference? At the end of the day, even if, if you have a banana, I have an apple. You have a curry and I have what? Bris and hilib. At the end of the day, what's both of the foods going to do? They're going to fill me, right? At the end of the day, the food's going to fill you up, right? So at the end of the day, a woman's going to fulfill your desire, right? 
Okay, well, one has a waist, the other one has a thin waist. The other one has what? Something that they're carrying <laughs> in a certain body part, and another one has another body part. At the end of the day, they have the same thing. They've got the same thing, right? One's got cute lips, so does the other. She's got dimples, she's got dimples too. And what? They're the same at the end of the day. Rather, the Imam goes on to say there's more differences between food than there is women. There's more flavors when it comes to food. Spicy, different levels of spice, sweetness, different levels of sweet, sour, salty, chewy, hard, juicy, steaks, you can get them medium rare, rare, well done. There's more variety when it comes to food. But at the end of the day, you don't go crazy looking at what's in another man's fridge. You don't start going crazy. So why do you go crazy over women when there's less differences? Rather, he said, this is from ajab. This is from what? Amazement. This is from stupidity. Some guy see a girl on social media. He starts falling in love with her, following her, liking her, dropping comments. And she has no concern in the word for him. Does that make sense? What's sad is that you will go after women, but you won't go after Allah Azza wa Jal. You'll try and please women and get the attention of women. Whether she's your girlfriend, whether she's not even your girlfriend. It could even be your wife. But you go out of your way for her, but not for Allah Azza wa Jal. The question is, why is it that you love someone in the first place? You love someone because of what they've done for you, right? The, the person who's done the most for you is the one that you love the, the most. Okay, maybe you love this girl because she she's been there for you. She's done stuff for you. She's, she's been there for you in your hard times. But has she done more for you than Allah? What has Allah done for you? I want to read you the statement from Imam Ibn Qayyim. He writes, I'm not going to read all of it, about two, three pages. Reasons for you to love Allah. So you can see all the good things that Allah has done for you. And then after this, I ask you, why is it that you don't put in the amount of effort with Allah and trying to get the love of Allah as you do trying to get women? As Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said, أَنَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ خَلَقَ لَهُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Allah is the one who created for you everything in the heavens and the earth and even in the akhirah. Are the animals made for us or are we made for the animals? The animals are made for us. Is the ocean made for us or are we made for the ocean? The ocean is made for us. Allah made for us the food in the ocean which is halal. Allah made for us the ocean as a way of transport to get from one place to another by sea. Allah is the made for us what? The trees. To give us shade, the, the vegetation to give us food, the animals to give us food. The whole world. Allah is the one who made everything on earth for you. He made the whole earth for you. No woman can, no woman can beat that. Even your mom can't do more for you than what Allah has done. Allah gave you the whole world. It's for you. Not just that. وَالْآخِرَةِ The next life. Paradise. You can wander in your paradise as far as you want. And you've got all of those amazing things in Jannah as well. ثُمَّ أَهَلَّهُمْ وَكَرَّمَهُمْ And then Allah honored you. How did He honor you? وَأَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهِمْ رُسُلًا He sent you His messengers. وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ كُتُبًا And Allah sent to you His books. Pay attention. If the most beautiful girl on earth, she sent you a message on Instagram, she creeped into your DMs, you feel happy, right? Oh, she's trying to reach out to me. She's trying to have a relationship with me. She messaged you and says, listen, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to marry you. And the dowry, I'm just going to ask for a kinder bueno. And if you can't afford that, just give me one of those milk, dairy milk buttons. It doesn't even have to be in the packet. Just take one button out and give it to me. I'll take it. And I'll marry you. And she's the most beautiful, high maintenance princess in the world. How would you feel? And she DM'd you. You'd feel like, wow, honored. She wants to be with me. She wants to be with me. But then Allah sent you the Quran. The king of kings. He sent a message to each and every single one of you. And what's shocking is that in the last third of the night, every single night, Allah Azza wa Jal comes to the lowest heaven. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He speaks to you every night. He says, who is calling me so I may respond? Who is asking me so that I may give? Who is seeking forgiveness from me so that I may forgive? Every night he does this. Every night. But we're too busy sleeping. We're too busy snoring. And Allah is talking to you, sending you a message every night. How sad is that? 
kutuba, and he even sent down to us his books. He gave us all a direct message. The Quran, and he gives us a direct message every night when we're sleeping. وَكَتَبَ لَهُمْ And by the way, imagine someone kept reaching out to you every day, and you kept ignoring them. Would you not? Would you, you kept reaching out to someone every day. Would you not get fed up and stop messaging them? Does Allah ever get annoyed? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever stop reaching out to you every night? Because you didn't. Ten years went by, you never woke up in the middle of the night once to make dua to him, to pray to him. Did he, did he say, you know what, forget this human, I'm not going to reach out to him the next day. No, the next day then Allah comes to the lowest heaven again and he calls you again. And you didn't answer. You ignored Allah. You were too busy focusing on the girl when you went to sleep. And when you woke up, you were too busy. But then again, Allah the next night he came again to the lowest heaven. He, he descended to the lowest heaven in a way that befits his majesty. And again, he called out to you. And he will carry on doing this to your final breath. Tell me that there is someone that deserves your love more than Allah No, it's impossible. وَكَتَبَ لَهُمْ بِكُلِّ حَسَنَةٍ يَعْمَلُونَهَا عَشَرَ أَمْثَالِهَا إِلَىٰ سَبْعِمِئَةِ ضِعْفٍ إِلَىٰ أُضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا Every time you do a good deed, Allah rewards you. Sometimes you might do a good thing for a woman, she won't reward you. In fact, she'll be, dis she'll be disobedient to you and be ungrateful to you. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where he said, I was shown the fire. وَأَكْثَرُ أَهْلِهَا النِّسَاءِ And the majority of those in the fire were the women. He said, يَكْفُرْنَ They disbelieved. The companion said, Did they disbelieve in Allah? The Prophet said, يَكْفُرْنَ الْعَشِيرِ وَيَكْفُرْنَ الْإِحْسَانِ They disbelieved in the good that their husbands had done for them. So it's a characteristic of women to not even appreciate what you do for them. Allah is not like that. Allah does not, not appreciate things you do. In fact, one of Allah's names is الشُّكُورِ The one who is grateful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that Allah Azza wa Jal he notices the good that you do and then he rewards you. A woman may reward you, she may not even reward you. Uh, and flip side, a guy might do things for a girl. And that, and that, and, 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 uh, sorry, a girl might do things for a guy. And then that guy doesn't reward her back either. But Allah is not like that. Inna Allah la ajral muhsineen. Allah does not let the reward of the good doers go to waste. To the point where Allah said, Whoever does a good deed, I'm going to multiply it by 10. So if you make one sujood, it's as if you made 10 sujood. If you give charity one date, it's as if you gave 10 dates. If you give 100 pounds, it's as if you gave 1,000 pounds. As a minimum. إِلَىٰ سَبْعِمِئَةِ ضِعْفٍ And Allah multiplies that 10 up to 700 if he wants to. Does it stop at 700? إِلَىٰ أَضْعَافٍ كَثِيرًا Allah can multiply even above 700 if he wants. That is what Allah does for you and I. Okay, pay attention. What about bad deeds? So every good deed you do is 10 rewards minimum, up to 700, even maybe more. Bad deeds? If I do one bad deed, is it also 10? No. When it comes to the evil deeds, Every time you do a bad deed, you just get one, one bad deed. Every time you do a sin, just get one bad deed. Okay, can it go away, the bad deed? فَإِن تَابُوا If you make tawbah minha from that bad deed مَحَاهَا Allah erases the bad deed وَأَثْبَتَ مَا كَانَهَا حَسَنَا And then He gives you a good deed in replace of the bad deed. Pay attention. You do a good deed, 10 up to 700. You do a bad deed, 1. You make tawbah, He erases the bad deed and then puts a good deed in its place. Just because you said, I'm sorry. And you meant it. Okay, what if you got loads of bad deeds? وَإِذَا بَلَغَتْ ذُنُوبُ أَحَدِهِمْ عَنَانَ السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرَ غَفَرَ لَهُ Even if your sins were to reach the sky that high and you said Allah forgive me Allah said Allah will forgive them What if your sins are higher than the sky? Your sins fill the whole earth They thin the whole earth He said وَلَوْ لَقْيَهُ بِقَرَابِ الْأَرْضِ خَطَايَا ثُمَّ لَقْيَهُ بِالتَّوْحِيدِ لَا يُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا لَأَتَاهُ بِقُرَابِهَا مَغْفِرَةً As the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions where he narrates from Allah azza wa jal that Allah said even if my slave comes to me with the whole earth filled with sins imagine how many atoms are on the earth imagine how many grains are in the earth how many bits of sand, how many bits of mud are in the earth soil if you come with that much an earth filled with sins Allah will meet you with an earth filled with forgiveness as long as you didn't do shirk as long as you didn't worship another God besides Allah. As long as you came with Tawheed, you only worshipped Allah alone. Allah will come to you with what? 
that much in forgiveness. Does that make sense? My brothers at the back, can you guys all come forward, please? Come forward, inshallah ta'ala. Everyone who's sitting, if you're participating, come forward, inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah Azza wa bless you. Please try not to distract each other, okay? Try not to distract each other. May Allah bless you. Ameen. And then after that, alahum atawba al Allah Azza wa Jal legislate for you toba. Imagine you can do a sin and know that in a second it's gone just by saying, Allah, I repent to you. And coming with the conditions of repentance. Pay attention. When you do toba, do you do it because of yourself? When you, when you turn back to Allah, Allah, I've come back to you. Do you do something yourself to come back to Allah? No, Allah Azza wa Jal, He appeals to your heart. And he causes you to come back to him. Allah makes you come back to him. You can't come back to Allah if Allah doesn't want you to come back to him. So Allah appeals to your heart and makes you come back to him. So did you even do anything when you said sorry? No. But imagine when you come back to him, he rewards you. For that which he did. You didn't even do it. And he rewarded you as a result of it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, وَشَرَ عَلَمُ الْحَجْ Allah legislated for you things like hajj. Things like hajj. What's so special about Hajj? الذي يهدم ما قبل The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, anyone who does a proper Hajj, is he is as if he, the first day he was born, all of his sins are gone. In fact, another Hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, anyone who does a Hajj mabrur, an actual proper Hajj, a good quality Hajj, what happens for him? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, his his reward is al jannah. How to get to paradise? It's so hard. It's so tough. Just do Hajj properly. It's so good, it's such a great act of worship. The only reward for Hajj is Al-Jannah. Imagine that. How easy Allah Azza wa Jalla made it for you. Does that make sense? وَكَفَّرَ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِ مَكَذَلِكَ مَا شَرَعَ لَهُمْ مِنَ الطَّاعَاتِ وَالْقُرُبَاتِ وَالَّذِي أَمَرَهُمْ بِهَا وَخَلَقَهَا لَهُمْ وَأَعْطَاهُمْ إِيَّاهَا وَرَتَّبَ عَلَيْهَا جَزَاءَهَا فَمِنْهُ سَبَبْ وَمِنْهُ الْجَزَاءَ وَمِنْهُ التَّوْفِيقَ وَمِنْهُ الْعَطَاءَ أَوَّلًا وَآخِرًا وَهُمْ مَحَلُّ إِحْسَانِهِ فَقَطْ all of the good deeds that you do, Allah is the one who makes you do them. You prayed salah today, Allah brought you to the salah. You came to the masjid today, Allah gave you the tawfiq. How many people are out there, brothers? Pay attention, how many people are outside right now and they're not in the masjid? For example, put your hand up if you saw the poster and you thought, let me come. You saw the poster, you thought, let me come, right? Were you the only ones who saw the poster? Thousands of people saw the poster. Thousands of people saw it. But Allah handpicked you to be the ones that Allah would say, I'm going to bring you to the masjid. Because Allah saw something good in your heart. Does that make sense? So if you're here, at least don't be distracted talking to each other. At least pay attention. Allah invited you to his house. Imagine that. People wonder why I can't go to the masjid. It's not, yes, your iman is weak. Yes, your iman is low. But also there's a deeper reason. Allah hasn't invited you to his house. So if you came today, Allah invited you to his house. So don't be disrespectful in his house and be distracted and talking to each other and not observing the manners and the etiquettes of the house of Allah. The first, that's the first thing. And secondly, be grateful. Allah brought me here. Allah has brought me to his house. And you came because he invited you and gave you the tawfiq to come. And then based on him bringing you here, he gives you a reward for coming. That is Allah Azza wa Jal. And there's so many more. Like I said to you, I read to you what? Less than a page and a half. In fact, I didn't even read a full page to you. He goes three pages just giving examples of things that Allah Azza wa Jal has done. But I don't want to make it too long. Does that make sense? Is this not someone that you should love? Should you put a woman before him? Should you put a woman before Allah? Should you put money before Allah? Should you put your music before Allah? Should you put anything? Should you put anything? Okay, sometimes people say, you know what? I don't put a woman before Allah. I'm a practicing person. I pray about five times a day. I love the deen. But they put, for example, certain ideologies before Allah. They put certain what? Ideologies before Allah. For example, Allah wants you to follow the way of the Prophet's companions. Who are the Prophet's companions? Sahaba. Why? Because you can never truly know what the Prophet was upon unless you follow the Prophet's companions. Were you there when the Prophet ﷺ was teaching? No. But who was there? Sahaba. So that's what Allah said. آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدِ اهْتَدَوْا That if you believe the way the Prophet and his companions believe, you'll be guided. Okay, so the companions are called the Salaf. Salaf just means the ones who came before you. Allah used the word in the Quran. وَأَنْ تَجْمَعُوا بَيْنَ الْأُخْتَيْنِ إِلَّا مَقَدْ Salaf. 
ولا تنكحوا ما نكح اباؤكم من نساء الا ما قد سلف الله يوز ذا تيرم من القران ات جست مينز ذا وان هو كان بيفور يو او وات هابند بيفور سو الصحابه كل السلف بيكوز ذي كان بيفور اس ا بيرسون هو سايز ام اون ذا دين اند ذي تشوز ذا ميثودولوجي اوف فور اكزامبل حزب التحرير او ا جروب لايك اخوان المسلمين بيبل هو انتو بوليتكس اند بروتستينج اول داي افري داي اوكي not about teaching people ilm not about teaching people what sunnah not about teaching people the actual thing that will give solutions to the problems of the muslim ummah people go out there protest and it makes them feel like what we achieved something today what did you achieve you think the kaf you're begging a kafir for help protesting is begging the kuffar for help they are the ones who created the problem for you in the first place for example for palestine we go and beg outside the british embassy can you do something can you intervene so they can help gaza who gave gaza Who gave Gaza and Palestine to the Zionists? It was the British. And then you go and beg the one who created the problem. And then we say, no, beg Allah. No, we need practical action. Practical action other than Allah? You are the reason why the Ummah doesn't have victory. Get out of here. People are out here screaming. Screaming like what? They're going to achieve something. It doesn't achieve anything. Did the Prophet ﷺ protest? I'm asking you a question. Did he protest? Could he have protested? Did protesting exist in his time? He could have. Because protesting has been around from the time of the Greeks before. The Greeks are the ones who invented these things. So could the Prophet have protested? Yes or no? Did he protest? No, he didn't. He did two things. He taught the people. And then he did jihad. You can't do jihad before you teach the people. You can't do jihad before you teach the people. You know why? Because like, yeah, a guy who doesn't know his right hand from his, He doesn't know how to do tahara He doesn't know how to do tahara Brother, you can't wake up to pray tahajjud prayer at night What's he going to do when arrows are flying in his face? He can't even fast Monday and Thursday How's it? He can't even give up food How's he going to give his life for the sake of Allah? It's a lie Man's playing too much Call of Duty He gets gassed if he's like a dramatic No, brother Calm down, sit down <laughs> Sit down There was a companion called Lukasha radiallahu ta'ala anhu In the battle of Badr In the battle of Badr, what happened? What happened? His sword broke. So he came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, oh, messenger of Allah, my sword broke. He said, my sword broke. So the prophet, he didn't have any swords to give him. He took off a branch from a tree and he said, go fight. Imagine I give you a branch from a tree and I say, go fight. And arrows are coming your way and swords that cut man's necks off are coming your way. You're going to say, I asked for a sword. He didn't even ask. He didn't even question. He went in there and he started swinging his branch. And Allah gave him victory. He wasn't fighting with his weapon. He was fighting with his iman. He was fighting with his iman. Allah said in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدَرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّةٍ Allah said, Muhammad, we, and your companions, we gave you victory in Badr and you were weak. We gave you victory in Badr and you were weak. Are the Muslims weak today? Are the Uyghur Muslims suffering? Are they weak? Are the Muslims in Kashmir suffering? Are they weak? Are the Muslims in Gaza suffering? Are they weak? The Muslim world, are the Muslims weak? Are they suffering? Are they getting bombed? Are they getting violated? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Like the Prophet's companions in Badr were weak. They were weak. 300 odd men against 1,000 men. Three, an outnumbered three to one army, weapons. These men didn't even have swords. There was only two horses. Imagine fighting a battle in those days with only two horses. Two horses. As Zubair al miqdad were the only ones who were on horses in that battle. They were the only ones who had horses in that battle. Does that make sense? Allah said, we give you victory in that battle. So you can be grateful. Where did the victory come from? Allah said, Allah said, Allah said, Allah said, remember Muhammad when you were telling the believers that Allah is going to send down angels to fight. He's going to send 3,000 angels with you. Allah is going to send down 3,000 angels to fight with you alongside of you. And Allah said, rather, Bala in Tasbiru. Allah said, rather, if you're patient, what tattaku and you have taqwa. Wayatukum min fawrim hada, yumdidukum rabbukum, bi khamsati alafim min al malaikati musawimin. Allah said, if you have patience and your taqwa, Allah is going to send 5,000 angels to fight with you, Muhammad. To tell you, it's not even about the number of humans. It's not even about the weapons that you have. It's not about whether you have nukes or not. It's not about whether you have planes or not. It's not about whether the government's on your side or not. It's not about whether you have an army or not. Is Allah with you? Allah sends down the angels to fight. Allah says, we will send down the angels to fight with you, Muhammad. Musa, we mean. 
But did the victory come from the angels? Even when Allah sent down 5,000 angels to fight with the Muslims, Allah said, وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرَى لَكُمْ وَلِتَطْمَئِنَّ قُلُوبُكُمْ بِهِ وَمَا النَّصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ Allah said, these angels, we didn't send them for to give you victory though. These angels are not going to do anything for you in terms of victory. They were just to make your heart feel good. So you could tell the believers, yo, yo, Allah is sending angels. Really? Jibreel is going to fight with us? It gives you confidence. Relax. Allah is sending angels. One of Allah's names is an nasir the one who gives victory. That's one of Allah's names, the one who gives victory. So that no one else can give you victory except for Allah. So Allah said, Muhammad, the angels didn't come for victory. Allah said, the victory only came from Allah. Now today you say to a person, Akhi, don't go protesting. Because you're begging humans. You're begging humans. And this doesn't solve anything. Allah doesn't. Allah only makes the Muslims weak when they leave their deen. Allah makes the Muslims weak when they leave their deen. Allah said, وَكَذَلِكَ نُوَلِّي بَعْدَ ظَالِمِينَ بَعْضًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ And like that we placed oppressors over you because of what you used to do. Allah said, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ Aid in Nas, and like that corruption spread in the land and the sea because of the sins that you did with your hands. So the Muslims fell into sins. The Muslims did shirk. The Muslims did bid'ah. The Muslims did what? Sins. In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Ida tabayatun bil'ina." If you start engaging in a type of riba, and you start becoming pleased with the dunya, wa adnatum, wa akhtum adna bil baqar, or kamaqal, you hold on to the to the tail of the cattle. Of the cow, I, you're following the dunya, you're chasing the dunya. You become pleased with your dunya. And you leave off jihad. Allah is going to humiliate you. And Allah is not going to uplift this humiliation. Till you come back to your religion. Not till you come back and you protest outside the embassy. Not till you go and beg the kuffar who created a problem. No, till you come back to your deen. Okay, which version of the deen? deen? The Sufi version of the deen? The Ikhwani version of the deen? The Shi'i version of the deen? Whose version of the deen? In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ila amrikum al awwal. To your original affairs. Al awwal. Who is awwal? In the Quran, Allah said, Al awwalun. Wa sabiqun al awwalun. Min al muhaji wal ansar. The companions are al awwalun. They are the first, the original ones. Come back to the religion of the companions. Come back to the religion of the Sahaba. That's how you will get victory. That's how Allah will uplift the humiliation. Nowadays you tell a man protesting. You have to do it. He says, at least I'm doing something. I'm not like you guys that are just in the masjid. What do you mean? This is what solves the problem being in the masjid. Ibn Taymiyyah, at his time the Mongols were coming and they were invading the Muslims and they were ripping them to shreds. They were ripping them to shreds. So the, so the, so the army in Damascus, they gathered an army. They gathered an army. Ibn Taymiyyah went to them and he took all the swords out of their hands. He said, listen, listen, put your sword down, put your sword down. He took the weapons out of all of their hands. He said, Wallahi, Allah is not going to give you victory today. Allah is not going to give you the victory today. Why? He said, because you didn't come with a reason for Allah to give you victory. You don't deserve it. In the Quran, Allah said, Allah said, Allah makes a promise. To those who believe and do righteous actions, what is the promise? The promise is that Allah is going to give them khilafah on the earth. Do you not want strength and ability on the earth? Put your hand up. You do, right? All of us do, right? We want khilafah, right? We want strength. We want establishment on the earth. We want tamkeen. We want to be strong again. We don't want our Muslims in China and Kashmir and all over the world to suffer. No, we don't want this. We want the Muslims to be strong again. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful. So Allah makes a promise. What do we have to do? Do we have to search for the khilafah? No. Allah said, لا يستخلف النوم في الأرض. Allah is going to do it. So these people with Hizbut Tahrir who say, oh, we're going to search for khilafah. We have to establish khilafah. Barakallah feek. You don't do it. It's not for you. Allah ascribed the action to him. This is a problem in Tawheed al -Ruwiyah. If you think you are going to give victory, you are going to establish something on the earth. It's not your job. You don't do any of that. Allah does it. Okay, so what do I have to do? At the end of the verse, Allah says, Ya'budunani. This is the condition. Worship me alone. La yushrikuna bi shay'ah. Just don't do no shirk. That's all you have to do. Don't do shirk. Get rid of the ta'weez. Get rid of what? The false gods. 
Tell people to stop worshipping graves. Tell people to stop worshipping themselves. Tell them to stop worshipping their desires. Worship Allah alone. Worship no one else besides Him. Be pure in your tawheed. You know, don't wear Nike. Don't celebrate Halloween. Don't celebrate Christmas. Don't say Merry Christmas. This is all types of shit. Don't say I swear my mom's life, which is a type of shit. Don't say I swear my mom's grave. Don't say I swear my mom's life. Only swear by Allah Azza wa Jal. Things that are for Allah, only do that. Don't do things that are not for Allah Azza wa Jal. That are for Allah for anyone else other than Him. Then you'll get victory. That's all you have to do. Is that hard to do? That's simple. But you know what's hard? Is that when you deliver this message to our brothers and sisters who protest, who are into politics, who are into all of these issues, they say, Akhi, I'm sorry. Now is the time for action. You have a problem with Tawheed. You believe that you will bring the victory. Allah Azza wa Jalla brings the victory. Does that make sense? We digress. The topic is about simps. Let's go back. Let's go back to the simps. Let's go back to the simps, sorry. What's your name, Akhi? Seth. Sam. 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 You look like a cool guy today, Allah Mbari. I don't know, you're, just, you're sticking out to me. In a good way, Allah Mbari. <laughs> the point we're making was don't put anything before Allah. Why did I mention this? I said some people, they put girls before Allah. Some people want money. Some people put their own ideologies before Allah. I come to you and I give you an ayah, hadith. Take it, don't ask questions. Not my sheikh said, this said, my group said, my ustad said, no, what Allah said. You don't put the statement of any man before Allah Azza wa Jalla and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now coming back to the issue of simping. Yes, we're back. So, I want to give an example of a man who loved his wife and he loved his son. But he didn't pick his son and his wife over Allah. <coughs> he didn't pick his son or his wife over Allah. Because a guy who's constantly just obsessed about women, women, women. Just his girl, his, his girlfriend. The girl, her boyfriend. They're struggling to even leave them off for the sake of Allah, right? Yes? And it's not even your wife. It's not even your husband. But let me give an example of a man who didn't think twice about leaving his wife and his son for the sake of Allah. And he didn't leave them because he was a bad man. That he was a bad husband or a bad father. No, he was a great father. In fact, Allah uses him as an example of one of the greatest fathers. Does that make sense? Ibrahim alayhi salam. But it's just that he loved Allah more than his kids. And he loved Allah more than his wife. And no one came before Allah Azza wa Jal. So the hadith in Al-Bukhari, a Muslim mentions, ثُمَّ جَاءَ بِهَا Ibrahim. Ibrahim, when his wife had a son, Ismail. He came and Allah Azza wa Jal told him, leave them in Mecca. Why didn't Allah tell them? Allah is testing him. Allah is testing him. Ibrahim, who's first? I mean, I have a daughter. Well, I have a daughter. I have a child. You know how people say when you have a kid, you know, it's different, you love your kid, you know, you never imagine harming your kid. Well, it's, it's different when you have a kid and you actually look at your child. Me, imagine me leaving my child in a desert. Allah says to me, leave her in a desert. That's such a, like, that's such a hard thing to do to even think about it. Does that make sense? So, but Allah told Ibrahim, leave them in a desert. So does that make sense? So, ثُمَّ جَاءَ بِهِ Ibrahim. Ibrahim brought his wife. وَبِبْنِهَا And his son, Ismail. وَهِيَ تُرْدِعُ أخي, his son was such a baby, he was still drinking milk from his mother's breast. He was breastfeeding him, does that make sense? حَتَّى وَضَعَهُمَا عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ عِنْدَ دَوْحَةٍ فَوْقَ زَمْزَمَ فِي أَعْلَى الْمَسْجِدِ And then he leaves them in Mecca, he just leaves them there. Okay, what was Mecca like in that time? Did they have people they could go to for help? Was there food? Were there shops? Was there, chicken? Were there, was there a chicken shop? Was there a curry shop? Could I get some chicken korma and some butter naan? Could they do that? No. Allah said, وَلَيْسَ بِمَكَّ uh, The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَلَيْسَ بِمَكَّةَ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ أَحَدْ There was not a single person in, uh, in Mecca that day. On that day, no one was living in Mecca. Not even one person was there. وَلَيْسَ بِهَا مَاءٌ Forget person, there was no water. Imagine you're being told to leave your wife and your child in a place where there is no people. Okay, we can live without people. Do we at least have water? You die if you don't have water. There's no water there. You have to leave them behind. فَوَضَعُوا مَا هُنَالِكَ He left them there for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Afwan? Naam. وَوَضَعَ إِنْدَهُمَا جِرَابًا فِيهِ تَمْرٌ وَسِقَاءً فِيهِ مَا And there was a little bag made out of leather, had some dates in it. And it had a little container with water. He just gave that to them. Here's some dates, here's some water. ثُمَّ قَفَّى إِبْرَاهِمْ مُنْطَلِقًا Then Ibrahim turned away and he started walking away. Imagine the pain he's feeling having to leave his daughter. Sorry, having to leave his son. He didn't, he, he didn't even say anything to them. 
Imagine as you're walking away the pain that you feel I'm having to leave them behind. Now look at this. What happened? فَتَبِعَتْهُ أُمُّ إِسْمَعِيلُ The mother of his child, she follows him. She comes after him. فَقَالَتْ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ She says, Oh Ibrahim, أَيْنَ تَذْهَبْ Where are you going? وَتَتْرُكُنَا بِهَذَا الْوَادِي And you've left us in this valley الَّذِي لَيْسَ فِيهِ إِنْسٌ وَلَا شَيْءٌ There is no person here and nothing, no food, no drink. Where are you doing? Where are you going? فَقَالَتْ لَهُ ذَلِكَ مِرَارًا And she repeated it. يَا إِبْرَاهِيم Where are you going? You're abandoning us. You're leaving us. Imagine, imagine your wife's running after you. Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? You're leaving me and your baby. No food, no nothing. You might think twice. And then she repeats it. She's following him. She's coming after him. لَا يَلْتَفِتْ لَا يَلْتَفِتُ إِلَيْهَا He didn't even look at her. Allah told him, leave them there and walk forward. Leave them. I'm telling you, leave them there. Walk forward. Me first. Not your wife. Not your son. I'm first. So he walks forward. And then suddenly she realizes, because he's not looking back at her. She says, Allah? She says, was Allah the one who told you this? Is the reason why you're leaving us here because Allah told you to leave us here? He, t he said to her, Naam, yes. Allah told me to leave you here. Qalat, then she said, because even her, she wasn't a woman that was so obsessed with a man that she placed a man before Allah, even if her man was a prophet. Not just a prophet, the greatest prophet after the Prophet Muhammad. So the Prophet Muhammad first, وسلم, then Ibrahim. Even that's who was the father of her, of her son. She wasn't so obsessed with him that it would make her forget about Allah. The moment he said, Allah told me to leave you here, she said, Even la yudayyuna. Allah is not going to neglect us. Allah is going to take care of us. As if to say, don't worry, Ibrahim, go. Don't worry. That's all I needed to say. Allah is with me. Allah is going to take care of me. You can go, Ibrahim, no problem. Now she leaves him. Remember, Ibrahim left her, right? And she was going after him. When she heard Allah, she said, no problem, no problem. Let me go back. Go, Ibrahim, don't worry. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I've got Allah. Does that make sense? I've got Allah Azza wa Jal. فَانْطَلَقَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ Then Ibrahim went forward. Until he got to a place where they could not see him. And when he got to a place where they could not see him, إِسْتَقْبَلَ, استقبل بِوَجْهِهِ الْبَيْتِ He turned and he looked towards the Kaaba. And he looked towards the Kaaba, ثُمَّ دَعَى بِهَا أُولَاءِ الْكَلِمَاتِ Then he made a dua to Allah Azza wa Jal with some words. وَرَفَعَ يَدَيْهِ He lifted his hands. And he said, رَبَّنَا مَا لُودِ He said, إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ من ذريتي بواد غير ذي زرع عند بيتك المحرم. He said, my lord, I've left my family, I've left my child, I've left my son, I've left my lineage, my offspring. I left them in a valley, which has no food, there's no vegetables, no vegetation, no fruits. By your house, ربنا ليق ليقيم الصلاة so they can establish the prayer. So then he says, Allah Azza wa Jal, he makes a dua. Allah turned the hearts of the people towards them and give them fruits, give them food and turn the hearts of the people towards them. Did that dua become true? So true that so much people's hearts turned towards Mecca and so much food came towards Mecca that Ibrahim's son is dead, who's passed away. And even his wife is not there anymore. Yet there are people that are coming every year more and more and more and more to Hajj. The people love it. You will spend £5,000 to go to Hajj and it's not a holiday. It's not the mosque, it's not the beach. But you will spend that. You spend what? A thousand plus pounds to come to Umrah. You do that. It's not a holiday. It's not the beach. You're not just hanging around, going shopping. No, you're worshipping Allah. Azza wa Jal. You're at the Kaaba, you're praying. You will spend that money to go and worship Allah. Azza wa Jal. Why? You love it. You want it. Allah made the people's hearts love the Kaaba, love Mecca. And when you go there, you'll find this place, a desert. The Zamzam water doesn't run out, number one. Number two, you can find yourself Turkish food there, you can find Lebanese food there, you can find Indian food, you can find Bengali food, you can find Indonesian food, you can find Malaysian food, you can find and you can find a Sunday roast, you find all of that there. Allah Azza wa Jal accepted the dua of Ibrahim. That's because of what? His patience and his perseverance and picking Allah Azza wa Jal before anyone else. Okay, but did Allah want to separate Ibrahim from his son? No. It was a test. Who are you going to pick first? Okay, pay attention. Ibrahim then became reunited with his family. And he built the Kaaba with his son. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّ لَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا They built the Kaaba together. 
So Ibrahim grows, Ibrahim, his son grows up. And Ibrahim comes to him. Imagine now you see your son grow. Now Allah Jal tests Ibrahim again. And Wallahi, this test is harder than the first. This test is harder than the first. Wallahi, this is emotional. Allah Jal, he said, فَبَشَرْنَاهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ We gave him the glad tidings of a son, I Ismail, his son. Allah said, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَعَهُ سَعِي When he reached the age, when he reached, he grew, he grew up a bit. He grew up a bit. He reached an age where he grew up a bit. Allah said, قَالَ يَا بُنَيْ That Ibrahim, he turned to his son. He said, إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ He said, I had a dream. And the dreams of the prophets are revelation from Allah. Meaning Allah is telling me to do this. He said, I swore in my dream, أَذْبَحُكَ I was slaughtering you. So he understands that I have been told by Allah to slaughter my son. So imagine having that conversation with your boy. He says to him, فَانْظُرْ مَادَا تَرَى He says, what do you think, my son? What do you think, my son? What's shocking is that Ibrahim was ready to do it. What's even more shocking is what his son said. He said, يَا أَبَتِي he said, my son, if ma tu'mar. He said, sorry, my father, do what you've been commanded. Allah told you to slaughter me, do it. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as He said, inshallah, my dad, I'm going to be patient. You're going to find that I'm patient. Do what Allah told you to do. The father picked Allah before his son. The son picked Allah before his own life. Falamma aslama. Ibrahim, he laid his son down and he placed his forehead on the ground, ready to slaughter him. And as he's about to slaughter him and take his head off, to cut him, Allah said, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ Allah said, we called out to him, Ayya Ibrahim. Allah said, O oh Ibrahim, قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا You fulfilled the vision that you had. You don't have to kill your son, don't worry, you don't have to slaughter him. That wasn't the point. Allah, did, Allah doesn't want you to harm your son. That was never the point. But were you ready to do it if Allah told you to? Were you going to put Allah before him? Were you going to put Allah Azza wa Jal number, number one? He did. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, إِنَّ كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُ الْبَلَاءُ الْمُبِينَ Allah said, we tested him. A mighty test. This was a hard test. Imagine having to watch slaughter your son. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذَبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ and Allah said we exchanged his son for an animal sacrifice and that's why on the day of Eid on the Eid after Hajj what do we do? we slaughter an animal for this reason this is the story we do it because we are remembering the sacrifice that Ibrahim السلام, made where he was ready to even slaughter his own son for the sake of Allah and this man can't leave behind what? a woman for the sake of Allah he can't leave behind what? Drugs for the sake of Allah. He can't leave behind what? A couple of friends that are bad influences on him for the sake of Allah. He can't what? Leave behind a little bit of sleep so he can wake up in the night and make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. He can't what? Leave behind and sacrifice a little bit of time on his PlayStation so he can come to the masjid and pray salah. So he can come and regularly seek knowledge and learn about the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. He can't do that though. He can't do that. And that is problematic. That is problematic. But when a person realizes, no, Allah is number one, they worship him. The things that Allah asks you to sacrifice are not like what they were told to sacrifice. You know that, right? You're not told to go up against your mom or dad or fight them in battle. No, Abu Bakr had to fight his son in war. Imagine having to fight your son in battle. Musa ibn Umair had to fight his brother in battle. Abu Bakr ibn Jarrah had to fight his dad in battle. Imagine you're in war and your dad's trying to kill you. You're in war and your son's trying to kill you. Because they were the kuffar and you were the Muslims. You weren't tested like that. You were just told, do, just do the basics. And a little bit more. My brothers, wallahi, to worship Allah alone, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet in accordance to the salaf, i.e. the sahaba, to pray your salah, to give your zakat, to fast, to do your hajj. And then when you get married, to give the rights of your wife. And when you engage in transactions, to make sure everything is halal, your risk is halal. To give your parents their right, to treat your neighbor well, to, be, to love each other for the sake of Allah Jal. Wallahi, these things go a long way. But you know why you and I struggle with them? Because we don't know Allah. Ibrahim knew Allah. Hajar, they knew Allah. They, these people, they knew Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why they were able to say Allah is first. When I read to you from this book, all of the things that Allah has done for you, put your hand up if you felt like, wow, that's deep. Like Allah really did all that for me? 
So I, mean, I told you, every night Allah comes to the lowest heaven and He says, who's calling me so I may respond? I saw some of your faces were like, wow, that's deep. every night Allah's calling out to me and every night I don't respond and then He comes and He does it again tomorrow the next day. That makes you love Him more, right? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It makes you love Him more. So the more you learn about Him, the more you do. That's why we keep saying to our brothers, you must seek knowledge. And I get tired of saying it. You must study, you must learn your deen. There's no two ways about it. You must make a commitment to come to the masjid and learn, attend classes, lessons, durus. Some of you have been telling you for two, three years. And every time you don't come and you're lazy or you pick some other motive other than coming to what benefit from your deed, you're picking something else and someone else other than Allah Azza wa Jal. Does that make sense? It's not saying that you can't have a good time, you can't enjoy it. No, you can. But don't pick anyone else before Allah Azza wa Jal. Pay attention. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he loved Allah more than anyone. There was no one that he loved more than Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal had already forgiven him his sins. مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ His future sins, past sins were all forgiven. Not just that, he was already rewarded the highest station in paradise. So let me ask you a question. One of the reasons we worship Allah so we can be forgiven for our sins, right? Another reason we worship Allah so we can get a good reward. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had both of those two things. He had the highest station in paradise and all of his sins are forgiven. I mean, he doesn't sin in the first place. Alhamdulillah, Allah saved him from them, those sins. Does that make sense? So then why would he worship Allah? Not just worship Allah Azza wa Jal, but he worshipped him to the point where his feet would get damaged. His feet would get swollen. One time he was asked, Oh Messenger of Allah, why do you do, why do you go so hard? He's spending the whole night worshipping Allah, his feet start to what? Get swollen. Imagine your feet swell. They swell, they expand because of how much you're standing worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Anyway, they said to him, You already, you already been forgiven all of your sins. He said, Afala akunu abdun shakura. He said, Should I not be grateful then? Okay, if I'm not worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal to be forgiven and to get a high status. At the very least, should I not be grateful that he's done this for me? So a person who's a grateful slave, he worships Allah for all of the things that he's done, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what the believing women are like. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi was able to get out of his bed, leave his wife that he loves, and I'm coming to you, ya Allah. I'm coming to you, ya Allah. Also, we have the example of the Prophet's wife, Zainab. Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, one time the Prophet, he came to the masjid and he noticed that there were two ropes. Imagine there's a rope from one end of the masjid and another rope from one end to the other end of the masjid. Like a straight rope here and a straight rope here. He came and he said, why are these ropes hanging off the masjid? He was told, this is your wife Zainab. She put these up here. Or she got put up there. Why? Because when she's praying, she prays so long that she can't stand anymore. So she puts one hand, one arm over one rope, another arm over the other rope, and her feet, they dangle so she can carry on praying. So then he said, take the ropes off. She's doing too much. She doesn't have to go this far. She doesn't have to go this far. But the point is that look at how much she was trying to go for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. How much she wanted to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. Another example, example of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As. He was a great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was a young man. His father, Amr, he got him married to one of the most beautiful and best women of Quraysh. In the tribe of Quraysh, he married him off to one of the best girls from Quraysh. And when he married her, imagine, what would, let me ask a question, what happens on a, on a wedding night? <laughs> you all know what happens on a wedding night, right? Huh? Huh? What happens on a wedding night? You don't know, right? You've been roasting your whole life. You're like, you know me, I wasn't a simp. You're saying, I wasn't that simp. I was, I was, I was, I was feminine, I had my gaze lowered. Now I married her, you're about to what? You're about to unleash the beast. <laughs> he's about to, He's, a, he's, about to, he's about to transform. Does that make sense? <laughs> he's about to transform. Because you're, you're, thinking, you're thinking to yourself, all I want right now is this woman, right? But this, most, this beautiful woman with high status, she comes, he marries her, he doesn't even, he doesn't even go to her. He's praying. He's like, oh, I got married? Okay, cool. It's Allahu Akbar, he's in Salah. He's praying the night prayer. He wakes up in the morning, okay, maybe you prayed at night, you didn't want to miss the night prayer. He's going to go to after Fajr? Maybe after Dhar Asr? No, he's fasting. He said, I'm fasting the whole day. And if you have intimacy with your wife, what happens to your fast? It breaks. It breaks. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe tomorrow night he's going to go to her. No, same thing. Pray. Day fast. And he's doing it every day. And his wife was a good woman. She didn't complain. But his father came to visit her one day. 
It's his daughter-in-law, right? His son's wife. He comes to visit her. He says, so how's your husband? How's my son? Like, you know, you guys getting on? Yeah, you guys everything good? Is he treating you well? She said, khayru rijal. She said, he's a very good man. She didn't criticize him because she was a good woman. Even though she wants some attention from her husband, she wants some time from her husband. She said, he's a good man. But she said, he's one of those guys that it's like he, I feel like he doesn't need me. He doesn't need a woman. It's like, he's, he's, it's like he doesn't even know we have a bed, she said. She said, it's like he doesn't even know that we have a bed. He's as if we don't even have a bed. So Amr, he understood this. He said, no, 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 I have to fix this problem. I have to fix this problem. So he got to his son, he went to his son, he stuck it on him, he said, what are you doing? And he told him of hard. And then he went to the Prophet, and then the Prophet وسلم, called Abdullah, his son, he called him. He said to him, أتقوم الليل, أتقوم الليل, he said, are you, are, you, are you standing the whole night praying? He says, yes, I do. He said, are you also fasting the whole day? He said, yes, I'm fasting the whole day. And then the Prophet وسلم, said to him, he said, as for me, لكني أصوم أفضل. He said, I, I fast, and then there's days when I don't fast. وأصلي وعلم, and, I, and, and this part of the night I pray, but the other part of the night I sleep. And the Prophet said, and I also go to my wife. I have, I have a wife, I go to her. Anyone who goes away from my sunnah is not from me, the Prophet said. So the Prophet had to tell him, calm down. You're doing too much. You're praying too much and you're fasting too much. This doesn't mean that you're praying too much. No, no, me and you are not like that. Me and you need to be told, do more. The companions, like the Prophet had to tell his wife, wait, wait, your, hang your legs are gone and you're hanging off ropes to pray. No, you don't have to go that far. Take a break. Take a break, no problem. And the Prophet had to tell Abdullah, take a break. Go to your wife. You got a wife, man, go enjoy her. But the problem, the point of the story is not that. Even though that's a lesson and a benefit to take. The lesson to take is how much he was in love with Allah and how much he wanted Allah and no one else. That he was willing to what? He didn't even, he didn't even it's like he didn't even realize he had a wife. Does that make sense? And then, inshallah ta'ala, before we come to the conclusion of the lecture, the last thing I want to do is mention to you about a woman called Rabi'a al adawiyya she was known to be a worshipper of Allah. It's not just men. Some women are into men. They're obsessed with them. This woman was not obsessed with men. She was in love with Allah. One time they found her saying, in the middle of the night, she was on a roof. She was praying to Allah. And when she finished her salah, she started making a dua. And when she was making a dua, she said the following words. She says, Ilahi. She says, my Lord, my one who I worship, Allah, gharatin nujum. The stars have come out. And the eyes have gone to sleep. And all of the kings of the earth, they have closed their doors. But Ya Allah, you the king of kings, you've left your door open. Your door is not closed, Ya Allah. And every lover right now is with the one that they love. But because, Ya Allah, you are the one I love, I am here with you right now. She said, everyone is in, the, in bed with the one that they love. He's asleep right now with his wife. The wife is asleep with the husband. Every lover is with the one they love. But Ya Allah, you are the one I love. So I'm standing before you, Ya Allah, calling out to you, worshipping you, begging you, forgive me, draw, let me get closer to you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and enter me into paradise. Does that make sense? Wallahi, you know, Umar ibn Khattab, he got stabbed. And as he stabbed, his guts are pouring out and he's bleeding. He's trying to pray salah. And he falls unconscious. They have to take him out of the prayer, bring him home. And as he's trying to pray, he's trying to pray. He's not able to pray. He falls unconscious. He can't pray. And they're trying to tell him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, relax. He says, La hadda fil Islam li man taraka salah. He said, there's no place in Islam for the person who leaves the salah. And he's saying this while his guts are pouring out. Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, another companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one time he was under siege. Hajjaj ibn Yusuf put him under siege. And they had a catapult and they were firing. You know what catapult? You put these big fat stones on there and you dash them. And these stones, they break and destroy the building that you're in. And they, kill, they annihilate you. It's like having a, you know, like, um, you know when they want a, a demolition, when they want to destroy a house, they put that big ball. What's it called? Wrecking ball, wrecking ball. Right? So it's, it, imagine having a wrecking ball fired at you. Or a cannonball fired at you. So it was like that. So he's in his salah, and there is this wrecking ball type of thing coming right towards him. 
He didn't even move. He did not even move once. I'm in salah with Allah. Let it hit me. I don't care. I'm, I'm in salah with Allah. I'm connected with Allah. Imam Bukhari one time was praying salah. He was praying salah. And there was something that was disturbing him in his back. It was hurting him. So when he finished the salah, he said to his students, lift up my shirt, lift up my khamis. There's something on my back. They found a wasp was there. It stung him 17 times. They said to him, Ya Imam, there's a wasp. It stung you 17 times. Why didn't you stop the salah? Why didn't you shorten the salah and make it quick and short? He said, I was in a salah and I was reading the surah in, the, in, in my salah. And it was touching me. I just couldn't disconnect myself from the surah. I was just so involved in it. Involved with the Quran. These are people who knew Allah. They knew what Allah had done. They were not ungrateful like me and you. Perhaps I shouldn't say me and you because maybe you guys are grateful and I am the one who's ungrateful. Maybe I'm projecting my ingratitude to Allah on you. So I shouldn't say that. Maybe you're better. And I'm sure you are. But the thing is, these great men were not ungrateful. They realized Allah gave me life. He deserves to be worshipped. He deserves to be obeyed. He deserves this, subhanahu wa ta'ala. To conclude, my brothers and my sisters, if you pick anyone else other than Allah in this world, know that eventually those things that you picked before Allah are going to leave you. They are going to abandon you. You pick this girl over Allah, a girl picks a guy over Allah, you pick drugs over Allah, you pick money over Allah, you pick the streets over Allah. You pick what? The mandem of Allah You pick your what? Game of Allah You pick your desires of Allah You pick anything Your ideologies, your groups and your sects and your imams And your sheikhs of Allah Know that On the day of judgment Allah is going to disconnect you from them And those people that you chose Are not going to help you Allah there are some people, they love other people or other things equal to Allah. But the ones who have iman, they don't pick anyone else over than, other than Allah. They love Allah more than they love anyone else. Then Allah says, When the people who you loved, when they see the hellfire, that girl, when she sees the hellfire, she's going to look at you and say, Salamu alaykum, brother. All of those girls you're running after, when they see the hellfire, Whoever it was that you picked, those mandem, whenever they see the hellfire, they're going to leave you. Allah's going to disconnect you guys. And they're going to leave you. And in your mind you're thinking, what? I held by you, I was by your side in this world. You turn right, I turned right. You turn left, I turned left. I didn't leave you. Even I used to come to the mission, I was advised, leave you for the sake of Allah. I chose you. Now you're leaving me on a day when I really need you. So then the person will say, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوا The one who was following, the one who was in love, the one who was obsessed. He will say, لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً فَنَتَبَرَّعَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّعُوا مِنَّا They will say, if only we had a second chance. If Allah could send me back, I will leave her now. I will leave her. I will leave all of this. I will leave these things for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. But it's too late. Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ These people are going to go to hell and they're not going to come out now. And that's if they died upon kufr, of course, the Muslim. It's a different story. To the point where my brothers listen. Forget this girl that you're running after. Forget the mandem that you're running after. Forget whatever it is you're running after leaving you. Your own mom's going to leave you on the day of judgment. How's that? Your mom will leave you on the day of judgment. Allah said, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أخي. On a day when a man will run from his own brother. Your brother. You're going to run from him. وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي And his mother and his father. وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي You'll run from your girl. Your wife, Wabini and your child, you run away from them. I want nothing to do with you today. They're running from you, you're running from them. Why? Because every man is going to be too busy with himself. Too busy with himself. Look at me, I've got my own sins, I'm sorry. Wife, get away from me. My son, get away from me. Mom, mom, dad, get away from me. Your mom's telling you, get away from me. I've got my own things to worry about. I've got my own stress. Don't come to me right now. I'm dealing with my own stress. To the point where Allah said, وَلَا يُسْأَلُ حَمِيمٌ Hamima, a best friend, a beloved friend, is not going to ask about another friend. Now today we might ask you, where's so-and-so? We haven't seen him in a while. Where is he? On the day of judgment? A friend is not going to ask about another friend. And you know what's strange? Allah said, They're going to be right in front of each other. 
You're going to be right in front of each other, but you're not going to care about the guy in front of you. Rather, Allah said, A man is going to wish on that day that he can ransom his son. He can wish he could ransom his what? His brother. He could ransom what? He could ransom his wife. He could ransom everyone on the earth furthermore so that he could be saved. وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا He wished, he, if he could, he would love the idea of saying, Allah, take my wife, take my mom, take my son, take my dad, take my granddad, my grandma, my grandkids, my kids' grandkids, all of them, put them in the hellfire. Everyone on earth. ثُمَّ يُنْجِي And then save me, Ya Allah. He will wish he could do that. So they're going to abandon you on that day, my brother. They're going to abandon you on that day anyway. So it's better you leave them for the sake of Allah in this world. You leave those sins of this, for the sake of Allah in this world so that you don't get left behind in the day of judgment. Because you can beg and wish and hope that Allah, today I'm going to leave them, take them and free me. Allah said, Kalla, no, inna halada. You're going to the fire. This fire, you're going to burn in it now. And what is this fire? Naza'atan li shawa. It's going to rip and peel off the skin on your head. It's going to peel off the skin on your head. It's going to cool. Cool. The fire is going to cool. It's going to invite the one who turned away. Who turned his back and he went away. He turned his back from the truth. He turned his back from the evidence. He turned his back from the delil. He turned his back from the haq. He turned away from the deen. So the hellfire is going to call him. He was too busy gathering the dunya. As much money as he could. As much girls as he could. As much respect or whatever it is that he could. So the hellfire is going to call that person. So it's best my brothers and my sisters that you leave. Those things that are not going to benefit you. For the one that will benefit you, and that is Allah Azza wa Jal. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. If you'd like to get more information about when the next event is going to be, the location, time, place, date, click the link below and join the Telegram group that will take you to a group where we have all the information about all of our live events. Wanted to give those of you who are not able to make it an opportunity to participate in the khair and that is that inshallah ta'ala if you would like to contribute towards the expenses of these events we don't charge anyone to attend but we do have a lot of expenses food whatnot the giveaways that attract the people to come in and whatever have you as you can see it brings in the youth the youngsters the ones who you know we really need to reach out to them and get them in the masjid and who knows someone may come to the masjid completely change their life and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the primary reason for that but then Allah Azza wa might have made you a means for that person or those people to change so donate as generously as you can at the link below and inshallah ta'ala please come and attend so hopefully we see you there inshallah ta'ala assalamu alaikum peace